Hi, this is Trey Miller with Global PM. Just to give you a little bit of a heads up on what I plan on covering in this video is just the overview of uh, the fundamentals of planning and scheduling. Uh, I am an instructor, a P6 instructor with, uh, with Global PM. Been doing this type of work for about 13 years now. I'm also PMP certified with Project Management Institute as well as I'm a P6 EPPM Certified Implementation Specialist. Uh, so I do teach P6 and the slides that I'm going to pr present to you today, it's a, a small subsection, a small snippet of the, the introduction to our Planning and Scheduling with P6 course. So this is just to kind of give you guys an overview of uh, what Planning and Scheduling is all about. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's, so let's talk some, some terms. Some of the terms that you've heard before in scheduling, one is critical path. Uh, we have lags, leads, total float. Uh, we also have a term free float that you may have heard of. So let, let's start with critical path. What is it? Well, you can read the definition here. It's the longest duration path through the schedule that determines the shortest time to complete the project. But what, what does that really mean? Well, it's the longest path that tells you the shortest amount of time that it'll take to complete the project. So you can finish no earlier than the end of the critical path. Uh, for example, uh, let's say you're building a home, something like roofing might be considered critical, right? Why? Well, because if roofing is delayed, well then obviously that's gonna push out the end of the project. And so that's what I, I discuss sometimes in the training classes, you know, well, is this critical? Well, this, you know, question comes up, well, this, this activity uh, is on my critical path, but it shouldn't be, or vice versa. And the, kind of the question you need to ask yourself is, well, if it's delayed, is it gonna push out the project's finish date? And if the answer is yes, then it should be critical and it should be reflected as, as so in your schedule. So that's critical path. Lag, this is a directed delay in, in, uh, in the start or finish of a succeeding activity. For example, if you pour a slab, you may insert a five-day lag for cure time. Uh, that's, that's one way of... Uh, of reflecting that de delay in the schedule. Some people might also have a separate activity for cure time. Lead is a negative lag. So prior to the finish of A, let's say, we're gonna go ahead and get started with B. So three, maybe three days prior to finishing A, we'll start B. So that would be a finish to start relationship with a negative three lag or three day lead. Float. Float is the amount of time an activity can slip before delaying the project's finish date. So typically that's associated with total float. Uh, free float, on the other hand, is slightly bit different. And what it is, is the amount of time an activity can slip before hitting its immediate successor. So normally, under normal circumstances, if somebody says, how much float do we have on activity A1030, they're referring to the total float. Okay, so in scheduling, um, we use a forward and backward pass to calculate early and, and, and late dates. Let me just skip through this slide and show you kind of a visual of what we have. So here's our network diagram. We have four activities, A through D. They're all linked together using finish to start relationships. And we have activity A starting on day one. So that ES stands for early start. Uh, it's day one. Let's call it Monday. So if, it, if that activity takes five days, and the durations, of course, are reflected in the bottom right-hand corner of each node, each, uh, each activity, starts on Monday, takes five days. When does it finish? It finishes on day, fr day, fr day five, which is Friday. Now, immediately after A finishes, both B and C can start. So when does B start? And some people say, ah, oh, Saturday or Sunday or Monday. I mean, yeah. in, in any of those cases, it's day six, but the specific day that it starts is really driven on the, by the calendar, right? So if you work in a 5 eighths work week and uh, it finishes at the close of business on Friday, well, it, it would probably start next Monday. So it starts in either case on day six, and if the duration is eight days, B would finish on day 13. And if you need to count on your fingers, and I say in class, there's nothing wrong with counting on your fingers, starting at 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 
13, you can see that's eight days. Um, so immediately after A finishes at five, B starts at six and finishes at 13. C also starts at day six, but because its duration is two days longer than, than B's, its, uh, its finish is day 15. Both B and C have to finish before D can start. So the earliest D can start, the ES, the early start, is going to be 16. And if it finishes four days later, it's all of day 16, 17, 18, and 19. Okay, so what we just did is a forward pass, which calculates the early and late dates. Now what we want to do is focus on what's called a backward pass. And that we will use to calculate the total float. So uh, let's start with D. If D, you know, if we're shooting for day 19, the latest it can finish is day 19. The latest it can start would be day 16. And the formula, just so you'll know, is late finish minus the duration plus one gives you the late start. So 19 minus four plus one is 16. Okay, C, the latest it can finish without pushing out D is also 15. And the latest it can start is day six. Now what about B? Well, that's a little different, right? So it can finish as late as 15. So it has a little bit of wiggle room, we'll call it for now. And it can start as late as day eight. Now what about A? You may be looking at it and saying, well, it can slip a little bit because B has some flexibility or some wiggle room. And I say, well, look at activity C. And then you immediately say, okay, yes, uh, it has no flexibility. So the latest it can finish is five and the latest it can start is one. Okay, so how do we calculate float? Well, it's the difference between the late dates and the early dates. So if I look at D, and I say late finish minus early finish or late start minus early start, those would both, both yield zero. C would also yield zero. A would yield total float of zero. And B, as we see, has two days of float. So in other words, the total float of activity B is two. The activities with zero float are critical, zero or negative. So here we can, we can see the, the float kind of shown here on the back end. And here's your critical path. So if, if the previous slide was what we were shooting for, and it was day 19, and we needed to compress this schedule. So I'm gonna go back to the previous slide. We needed to compress this schedule. How could we go about doing that? And most people say, well, you can either add manpower or man hours. That's true. I could, you know, I, I could look at adding more manpower to these critical activities. Um, I could look at increasing the work hours on the resources of these critical activities. I might also look at shifting resources from B to C, for example. Okay, so those three methods that I just mentioned, they all fall under crashing the schedule because what we're doing is compressing the critical path items by either increasing the number of man hours or increasing manpower. The other option is called fast tracking. And that's, you know, if you think of railroad tracks that run in parallel, we are looking at running activities in parallel. So for example, maybe we've added some resources to the project and now we can start D a day before C finishes. And in that case, C and D would in par partially run in parallel and that would pull the project in uh, a little bit. So I hope this, this demonstration and discussion has helped. If you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to give us a call. You can, uh, we can also answer any questions regarding training classes that we offer. Uh, our phone number is 985-781-9190, or you can look us up on the web at www.globalpm.com. Thanks for watching.